welcome to tony's tutorial and here with this video we start our journey of the much awaited spine biomechanics or the vertebral column biomechanics yes today onwards we are going to have the spine biomechanics and pathomechanics in the most simplified manner i know that many of you were eagerly waiting for this and was constantly asking me to have the videos on spine biomechanics and today we have the right start that is we are going to start from this video onwards our journey of exploring the spine biomechanics to its full and I tell you, spine biomechanics is one of the most fascinating and thrilling at the same time challenging biomechanics to deal with. It is of course a complex biomechanics, but not as complex as your wrist or hand complex. But it is a bit complicated or complex because the spine serves two important functions. What are they? two contradictory functions which we saw that in shoulder complex which we had completed or we are about to complete right now that there is a function of mobility and stability and we saw shoulder has a stability mobile uh, reduced or compromised for its mobility but here in the spine we see that these two diverse function served in a systematic or a with equal weightage right now with this video we start this discussion and here we discuss the structure of this vertebral column the different curves of the vertebral column the mobile segment in the vertebral column and the typical vertebra and its features and finally a condition known as spondylolisthesis if you wish to jump on to any specific topic, the time codes are given below and kindly check on to that. Given below and kindly check on to that. And now here we explore the spine biomechanics here in Tony's tutorial. The spine serves two important functions. One is stability at one hand and mobility at the one uh, at one hand. We know that I'm able to flex forward, extend, laterally flex, and rotate at the same time. I'm able to keep the stability of the spine. It is a very intact structure. So two sides of this coin, stability and mobility, is compromised with equal weightage in the spine, which we don't see in any other joints in human body. And that makes the spine complete very special. And you know that there are how many vertebras? There are 33 vertebras. And how many intervertebral discs? There are 23 intervertebral discs. So spine or vertebral column comprises of 33 vertebras and 23 intervertebral discs. And you know that how these vertebras are arranged and there are five zones of arrangements or five different regions one is a cervical then it is the thoracic region then it is the lumbar region then it is a sacral and then it is the coccygeal region of coccygeals and you know how many vertebras are there in cervical region which is very known to you all seven vertebras thoracic region we have 12 in lumbar region we have five so total all these 24 vertebras are individual one. That means they are not fused together. These vertebras here, sacral 5 and coccygeal 4 may be fused together. So we write the formula in brackets. Okay. So these five vertebras may be fused and this may be fused or this are fused together. So these are fused vertebras all together 9. So among the 24 vertebras, 20, 33 vertebras, 24 are individual ones which are divided into three different regions, cervical region 7, thoracic region 12, lumbar region 5 and in sacral and coccygeal region we have respectively fused vertebras of 5 and 4 in number totally making up this number to be the 33 which you should not forget and at the end of this video we will have the most important questions which 
are very much special for the students who are watching for this watching this video and at the same time we'll try to include few mcq questions which you make this video much more interesting so stay tuned at towards the end of this video so this are the region wise division of the vertebral column and we see a general pattern that the size of the vertebra increases from cervical to lumbar region so generally there is an increase in the size of vertebra from cervical to lumbar region and from them it decreases now more importantly we need to understand that there are some curves in the vertebral column or when you look a person's vertebral column from sideways or sagittal view you see that it is a curved rod not a straight rod instead it is a curved rod why do we have a curved rod instead of a straight one for example this is a straight rod now the straight load when it is been loaded there is a limit to the load that it can withstand or there is a limit to the compressive load that it can withstand so in order to better be better efficient to withstand the compressive load we have a curved structure like this for the vertebral column and this curved structure makes it efficient in load bearing what is that it makes it efficient in load bearing now if you look into the curves of the vertebral column uh, we have different curves like a, a curve with the posterior convexity for example this is the anterior region this is the posterior region any curve with a posterior convexity that is convex in the posterior side are known as kyphotic curve what is that are known as kyphotic curve any curve with an anterior convexity is known as lordotic curve so there are two type of curves which you can find in the vertebral column one is a curve with the posterior convexity like this this is known as the kyphotic curve and another is a curve with anterior convexity anterior end is convex that is the lordotic curve there are two type of curves or two different shapes of curve one is uh, kyphotic and one is lordotic curve now let us see where these curves are actually located for that you have to go on to the embryonic life or fetal life in fetal life we just have a single curve with posterior convexity so we have a very single curve a single curve with posterior convexity in the fetal life so this would be a curve like this okay now when the child starts growing when he starts crawling and he starts walking that is with weight bearing and the simultaneous activities of the child the other curves starts to develop that is this posterior convexity curve, convex curve becomes in cervical region like this that is you have an anterior convexity in the cervical region in thoracic region it would be like that itself and in lumbar region you get another curve so ultimately by adult age old or when the child starts its weight bearing or by total life he has or she has the complete curves which are normal to human beings so the curve would be looking like this in uh, cervical region we have this one in thoracic region in uh, sacral and lumbar now if you look at this curve, region this is just a big exaggerated one this is uh, a lordotic curve here we have a kyphotic curve here also we have lordotic here we have kyphotic curve what was the curve that you are seen in a child in his embryonic life that was the kyphotic curve there are thus there are two regions in the vertebral column the where there is a kyphotic curve present so that curves we call it as primary curves that curves we call it as primary curves because this were the curves that was developed in the embryonic life and there was no modification for it and there are two regions where there is a lordotic curve developed that regions we call it as the secondary curve because this was developed secondary to the primary curve that was existing in the embryonic life so ultimately we have two type of curves this was the shape of the curve kyphotic and lordotic but we have two types of curve one is primary curve Curves, which are the kyphotic curve that is the posterior convex curves and two lordotic curves which are secondary 
This is present in the cervical region, which you know that in the cervical region, this is present in the lumbar region, and this is present in the thoracic and sacrococcygeal region. So that's all about the curves of the vertebral column. So here you need to understand the curves are developed with different consecutive aging or when a child begins from embryonic life to uh, childhood to the toddler age and to the adulthood the curves develop right now we move on to the next important aspect in the vertebral column that is the third topic of our discussion which is the concept of a mobile segment so if you're a student who watches this beware that this can be asked as a three marks or five marks question and in fact there is nothing to write in three or five marks so you have to just add on few important points so what is a mobile segment then may i ask you in mcq questions this what is uh, a mobile segment because mobile segment is the functional unit of a vertebral column so mobile segment is a functional unit of a vertebral column at in and it includes some two consecutive vertebras for example this is t1 and here you have the t2 so the mobile segment involves two consecutive vertebras and the intervertebral disc between them so two consecutive vertebras and the intervertebral disc to between them is together known as the mobile segment. It also has all the associated structures like ligaments, tendons, fascia and all other connective tissues associated with them. So totally two adjacent vertebras and its intervertebral disc along with other connective tissues around it makes the mobile segment which is the functional unit of the vertebral column. Clear? So what is a mobile segment is uh, two adjacent vertebras along with the int intervertebral disc and associated connective tissue structures. But you know that there are 33 vertebras and 23 intervertebral disc. So some regions there the intervertebral disc may be absent and in that region mobile segment is just made by superior and inferior vertebra and its associated connective tissues. Is that, ex is that clear? It's just an exemption that uh, in regions where the there is no intervertebral disc, that regions the mobile segment is made up of superior and inferior vertebras itself. Um, we need to understand, for example, we label the movements in the vertebral column with respect to the superior vertebra. For example, if my T1, C7, we have here C7 vertebra, it is moving anteriorly, we enable the name uh, movement with respect to the superior moving vertebra. So if this is moving for the flexion and this is uh, going for posterior movement, still we label the movement in the vertebral column as flexion itself. And we always take the anterior part that is the body of the vertebra for our reference. We don't look what is happening to the spine, whether spine is going for an extension or flexion. We label everything with respect to the body of the vertebral column. These are some important points you should remember throughout our discussion. Clear? So that is the thing about the mobile segment and we also are discussing about the curves of the vertebral column. And now straight away we move forward to the most important discussion in today's video that is the typical vertebra. Which can be a sure question. What is a typical vertebra? Okay, the typical vertebra may be made up of two important parts one is the body of the vertebra which you know that okay and neural arch so the typical vertebra is made up of two important structures one is the body of the vertebra and the neural arch you know that this is the body of the vertebra which of course you can say that is specially designed for weight bearing one on the another the vertebra sits and sits and the weight is transmitted from one to the another so the body of the vertebra is anteriorly located so this is how it is oriented and this is seen anterior to the body anteriorly located part of the vertebra and it's specifically designed for weight bearing superior and inferior surface are relatively concave sorry relatively flat superior and inferior surfaces are 
relatively fat. Now we see that uh, this if this is the anterior part, back to this we have the structures. This are known as the neural arch. Immediately just uh, above the or just after the body of the vertebra, if this is the body of the vertebra, we have structures passing on from here to here. So this structure is known as the body and all the structures over here, like the spine, the all other structures are known as the neural arch. So these structures are known as the neural arch of the vertebra. Let us see what is this neural arch made up of. Okay. So the neural arch of a vertebra would be made up of two important parts. They include the first one, it is the pedicle of the vertebra, which you might know, and the posterior elements. What is that? The pedicle and the posterior elements. Right now we have seen that we have here the body of the vertebra. Okay, the body of the vertebra is joined to posterior structures like this with a uh, bony part over here. This region is known as the pedicle of the vertebra. Immediately then joins to form the lamina, the transverse process, spinous process, etc. Which we will discuss later. So this structure over here is known as the pedicle of the vertebra. So how do you define pedicles? They are very stout, okay? very small but strong structure you can see that this vertebra is linked to the uh, body with the help of this strong structure very small compared to other structures in this region which is a very small part of this region so they are very short small regions of the vertebra which connects the body to the posterior elements i told you there is posterior elements so the body is connected to the posterior elements with the help of your vertebra with your pedicle. So pedicle is a structure which connects the body to the posterior elements. Okay. And now you know that the force is transmitted from a superior to inferior vertebra like this. Okay. When force is transmitted from one vertebra to another, the force transmission from body to the posterior elements is done by the intermediate link that is the pedicle. So pedicle is a stored strong but small structure which connects the body to the posterior elements and also it helps in the transmission of forces from body to the posterior elements that's all about the which one the pedicle now we move on to the posterior elements of the vertebra here you can see that immediately after that you have a posterior element that is known as the lamina of the vertebral column and then you have the spinous process of the vertebral column then you have the articular process of the vertebral column then you have the transverse process of the vertebral column now you see from this one Okay, so this is the body of the vertebra and the small structure over here is the pedicle and you can see that the pedicle is linked to other posterior elements. The pedicle is linked to other posterior elements or the articular process with the help of this uh, strong pillar like regions. These are known as the lamina. They are vertically oriented. They are vertically oriented strong structures which links the pedicle to other posterior elements. What would be its function? It will also help in the transmission of force. Now there is an important region in the lamina which you should remember which is very important with respect to your mcqs or in viva that is a structure known as pars interarticularis it is a very small region in the lamina this region in the lamina where force is actually transmitted from lamina to the articular surfaces or the spine or the transverse process so this region of the lamina we call it as the pars interarticularis later we will see what is the peculiarity of the pars interarticularis. So the posterior elements contains the lamina and then this is the spinous process which is projecting posteriorly. There are differences in the orientation of the spinous process between different layers of the vertebra which you will study later when we describe layer by layer, region by region or region specific vertebral column. Okay and now 
the lamina is actually becoming here you see the canal this is the vertebral canal through which the spinal cord passes so the lamina forms the boundary of the or the roof of the vertebral canal so the roof of the vertebral canal is formed by which structure which is the lamina and now we have some structures over here can you see this one this is the articular process. In fact, you can see the process it's, processes itself. See the concave shaped processes, the side and here two articular process inferiorly. So we have two articular process superiorly. We have two articular process inferiorly. The superiorly located articular process, for example, this is the first vertebra or articulates with uh, what is this articular process of this vertebra? This is the inferior one right now. So this is, for example, this is T1, T1 vertebrae has, this is it's a superior articular process, which you see here, two superior, two inferior articular. How many articular processes are there? Four, two superior, two inferior. Now, this T1 is articulating with the T2, which is below it. So where will this inferior articular facet articulates in this T1? It will articulate with the superior articular process of the T1. It won't go for the inferior. Vertebra is not going to sit like this. It is going to articulate with the superior articular facets of the lower vertebra. So when you write about articular process, these are the processes that connects the vertebra together. So a superior articular for one vertebra's inferior articular process articulates with the superior articular process of the lower vertebra. And this one's superior articular facet articulates with another vertebra's inferior articular process. Okay, clear? That means there is some bit of confusion, but once you just look into a pictures or just look with the help of a body, it is easy. How, what is the statement? A vertebra's superior articular facet articulates with the inferior articular facets of the superior vertebra. A vertebra's inferior articular facets articulates with the superior articular facets of the vertebra below. Clear? Once again, I will define it for you. So we have the T1 vertebra, we have its superior and inferior articular process. If this is the T2 vertebra, the inferior articular facets of this T1 will articulate with the superior facets of this T2. Okay? Now, for example, this is the T2 and this is the T1. T1's T2 is superior, here we have, is articulating with the inferior of the vertebra above. Okay, so that is the statement over there, that is the vertebra's superior face that articulates with the inferior of the superior face uh, vertebra and vertebra's inferior articular face that articulates with the inferior of the superior of the lower vertebra. And now we have the transverse process which are overseen here, which is attachment sites of a various spy muscles the articular process and the spine sorry the transverse process and the spinous process act as an attachment site of various muscles which are seen around the vertebral column and of course the ribs also which we will study later i hope that is clear with respect to typical vertebra you have to draw some diagrams you have to draw the diagram define with the help of the diagram do not study it for by heart just look at this diagram this board and then study we have anterior located uh, body then you have the pedicle which connects the body to the posterior element then you have the lamina which connects the pedicle to the posterior elements rest of the posterior element then you have two superior articular faces two inferior two transverse process the spinous process always remember this diagram and then study the things and look which are them linking together am i clear i hope it is if you're watching this video without subscribing to our channel consider subscribing to our channel and keep the bell notification so right now here you can see the orientation of a trabecular system in the vertebral column we know that the vertebral column has a great role of uh, bearing the compressive load as well as the tensile load. So, in order to bear this load, there is a trabecular system which is well developed in the vertebral column. It's not just that the vertebral column is made up of a piece of bone, but it is actually a cancellous bone and a cortical bone uh, mixed together. That is, um, there is an inner layer of trabecular system which is going to be very specialized in the areas of weight bearing. Similarly, you can see in this diagram, there are some areas where there is thickened trabecular system. Usually, it is a vertical oriented subcular 
trabecular system but at the regions like a pedicle and lamin as you can see fan shaped trabecular system which uh, add on to the uh, compressive strength or load bearing strength of the vertebral cord and here we have the clinical conditions related to our discussion that is a spondylotic spondylolisthesis and i hope you remember what is pars interarticularis which is actually some regions of lamina which are very helpful with respect to the force transmission in earlier diagram or earlier representations we have identified what is pars interarticularis now when in patients or in due to some trauma when pars interarticularis is, is bilaterally fractured or bilaterally there is some fracture in the pars interarticularis that condition uh, results in a spondylolisthesis or spondylotic spondylolisthesis so it is the fracture of the pars interarticularis and as a result the superior vertebral body actually gets a slipped forward so the characteristic feature is a slipping of the superior vertebral body forward and this occur mostly in the region known as l5 s1 region because of the uh, orientation and the peculiar angulation of that l5 s5 region and due to large amount of shear force which exists in that region so this is the condition or known as spondylotic spondylolisthesis where the posterior elements are separated from remainder of the neural arch and the vertebral body so this we wind up this video if you want the notes of the same you can check on to my website www.biomechanicsworld.com and don't forget to follow us on the instagram so that you get daily mcq and other fun facts absolutely free of course and here we move on to the important questions in this region the curves of the vertebral column the mobile segment the typical vertebra and pars interarticularis all this can be short note questions and in the only typical vertebra can be asked for a short essay on to the mcq questions that can be asked how many primary curves are there in the vertebral column which are two the convexity of the curve in fetal life which is a posterior convexity what is pars interarticularis you know that we defined it very well and what is the common site of a spondylolisthesis where you know that it is l5 s1 region and if you like the video as i always say tell kindly click the like button and subscribe to our channel